God moves in a mysterious way His wonders to perform He plants His footsteps in the sea And rides upon the storm Deep in His dark and hidden With never failing skill, he fashions all his bright designs and works his sovereign will. So God's purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but the sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure. Scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. So God. Oh, 
John is, and why am I up here? Uh, John uh, was helping out with a uh, Word of Life uh, reverb in Michigan, and both he and Linda are uh, returning back from that soon. So keep them in their prayers for, for safe travels uh, and that they get the, uh, uh, the rest they may need to recover from, from that. Um, getting into announcements this morning. Uh, Sunday school after church today, uh, 11.55 a.m., and then our children and teen ministries uh, this evening at 6. Olympians will be meeting uh, downstairs and uh, the teens over at his place. Uh, ladies Bible study this week is at 6.30. That too is also at uh, his place on Tuesday. Uh, it's, and it's um, at his place due uh, to the church being used as a, uh, a voting site. Uh, this Thursday is our adult uh, midweek service. Our prayer meeting is at uh, 6.30 on Thursday. And then on Friday, our uh, teen group is going to the, the Word of Life Reverb um, in uh, Glens Falls. So keep them in their, your prayers as well for, for uh, uh, safe travels uh, and for the, the leaders that are, that are going. Um, before I get into the Thanksgiving cards, actually, I don't want to forget... Um, on the 18th of November, um, I was asked to um, also let everybody know here as well that the, um, the women's brunch will also be a, a baby shower. Um, apparently someone's having a baby. I, I don't know who that is. Um, Thanksgiving cards on the back table um, are for our um, shut-ins. So if you have a, a moment to, uh, to sign those um, and greet those um, who aren't able to um, attend our, our church services um, to, to uh, encourage them, and I believe uh, Linda sends those out at, at some point in time. Um, and then Operation uh, Christmas Child, there's only a couple Sundays left um, for this um, to get your shoeboxes in. If you have any questions, see Deb Baker or Kathy of an Ostrand. Um, and I believe we are in need of any small um, toys as well, if you can come and bring those in for some of the, the shoe boxes that, that are um, being prepared, I, I know that would be, be greatly appreciated. Also, as a reminder, our church has a, a new website. Um, the links, there's a couple different links that'll take you to um, uh, the website. Um, so just to remind you guys to, to visit that, get familiar with the information available on there. Um, I know if you ever um, aren't able to a attend a church service, I know all sermons are, are, um, are posted on there as well for you guys to, to see. Um, and then just a special uh, thank you to, um, to all who helped um, at the, the Kestids the past um, couple of weeks. Um, I guess the sale, yeah, sale uh, tomorrow actually. And then a reminder as well, our annual business meeting is uh, December 10th. Um, just uh, put that in your calendars as we'd like you to, to, um, to attend and, and, and take part um, in that if you can. And then immediately following uh, the church service today, please join us for some uh, um, refreshments and a, and a time for fellowship. Um, if you don't go quick, my kids will have the food gone before you get there. All right, just to get into uh, our scripture reading this morning, it's uh, Romans 11, uh, verses 33 through 36. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. 
Amen. Let's go to the Lord um, in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we, um, we thank you, Lord. Um, we thank you for the opportunity, uh, the ability, and the, the freedom to, to come here, Lord, and, uh, and, and uh, worship you, Lord, uh, to fellowship with, with one another, Lord, um, and to spend time um, studying your, your word, Lord. Um, Lord, we just pray for um, those who, who aren't able to, uh, to make it here, Lord, um, you know, whether it's, um, you know, through illness or, or um, just being bound to their, their homes, Lord, just, just um, have your pres presence and encouragement uh, felt by them today, Lord. Um, Lord, we, we thank you as well for um, the, the privilege we have to, uh, um, to, to minister to others, Lord. Um, just ask that uh, you give those that are that are ministering in the, the nursery and, and junior church and in and Sunday school today, Lord, just um, give them, them wisdom and, and strength. Um, and Lord, as, uh, as pastor comes um, uh, this morning, Lord, we just um, we ask that our, our, our hearts and our, our minds are open to the words that uh, you've put on his heart, Lord, to, to share with us today. Um, and that we will um, not only retain um, what is spoken, Lord, but that we will uh, apply it to our lives, Lord, um, so that we can, we can live out the, um, the will and the, the plan that you have made for each and every one of us to follow, Lord. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
I chose these last two songs <clears throat> because they echo the goal I have for these four weeks that I'm supposed to share with, with you. But I think it's good uh, that we begin this morning with a word of prayer. Father, we come to you this morning as the author and the finisher of life, the one who is at work in each of our hearts, drawing us to yourself, pouring out your mercy and your grace, and filling us, Father, with your light and your goodness. We praise you this morning that as we come into your presence to consider your word, Father, we pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear and a heart to receive, Father, the message that you have for us this morning, that we might come to you as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the gracious God who extends mercy to us, and that we might find, Father, through these words, a deeper understanding of who you are and who we are to be as a result. We praise you this morning for the privilege of having your word and hearing your word and ask now, Lord, that you minister to us in a special way. And all of God's people would say, amen. As I said, I, I chose those first two songs, or these last two songs, because they echo uh, that the message that I desire to put across over the next few weeks. The first song spoke of the gracious king to whom we come empty-handed. It's not until we come empty-handed that we find grace. It's not, beloved, until we lose ourselves in Christ that we find our way through life. But as we come empty-handed, we find acceptance based on his grace and his love alone. But we must remember it's to a king. It's to a king that we come. We come to him as our savior, but we come to him as our king. And we bow down in grateful praise as the first hymn so beautifully stated. Uh, used to be in, the, in a bygone era, our first song that we sang on Sunday mornings was a call to worship. And this certainly is a call to worship. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and let us sing. Oh, praise him. Praise him. Hallelujah. A call to worship. The second song expressed the work of God in his good and gracious ways as our good and gracious king as we come to him asking for his goodness and his grace to be poured into our hearts and our lives. I recall some time back talking with a Christian lady. I believe she'd been a Christian for quite some time, and she was going through some very difficult times in her life, and I'll never forget the words that she spoke that went something like this, not a direct quote, but this is the idea. She said, I don't understand what's going on, and as I talked with her, I realized that it was because her life had always been so blessed that she had never suffered anything, and thus had, I don't want to be judgmental, but thus had very little depth of soul, very little understanding of the work of God in the hearts and lives of his people. The song uh, that we sang echoes God's answer to our prayer and causes us to grow by taking us down the road to despair. I remember those days. I won't share them with you again because you've heard them too many times, though some of you are new. Those dark days. But those dark days when Lord, the Lord brought me to despair but really taught me who he was as he met me there. The 
the song said, I hope that in some favored hour, I hope that it was in the good times, in the favored hours, that uh, I would find the answer to my prayer. Instead, God made me feel the hidden evils of my heart. It's not until the dark days come that we really begin to see what's inside of our very beings. And he let the angry powers of hell assault us in every part. Yes, with his own hand, he seemed to aggravate my woe, crossing all my fair designs and schemed that I had schemed and humbled my heart and made me grow. The song echoed the words of the scriptures that, that come throughout the scriptures. The general theme of, of the scriptures, in, in my opinion, some might disagree, but that's okay. But the general theme of the scriptures, as I see it, is, is the kingdom of God. From the very beginning to the very end of scriptures, God is, is working in his people as the king, forming a kingdom. The Old Testament kingdom, as we'll see, I hope, next week, is different than the New Testament kingdom. But yet it's a kingdom. It's just uh, led or governed, I guess is a better way to put it, in different ways. So the general theme of scriptures is the kingdom of God. Uh, the general theme of scripture is the kingdom of God and, and his gracious work in bringing many sons to glory. I love, I love that passage in Hebrews that talks about bringing many sons to glory. But even the process of bringing many sons to glory was done through suffering. Listen to the words of Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. For it was fitting for him for whom all things and through all things in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of salvation through suffering. Even Christ suffered accomplishing God's purposes. What makes us think that God is going to be able to accomplish his purposes through us without walking through dark and difficult days and coming to know him in a deep and personal way and having a depth of soul? Is this not the message of the book of Job? Butch loves the book of Job. I have a very hard time with the book of Job. I love the first chapter, and I love the last chapter. The ones in between drive me mad. But it, this is the message of Job. Did not Job say in the very end, after all of the things that he had suffered, have, I have heard by the hearing of the ear, but now I see with my eyes. He said, I'd heard about you, God. But it wasn't until you took me to the depths of despair and heartache and suffering. Can you imagine what Job went through when in a matter of days or hours, I don't know, he lost his home, his children, his possessions, his health, and even his wife, so to speak, turned against him and said, why don't you just curse God and die? And he sat there in the ash heap of life, covered with boils or some kinds of sores. But yet at the end, as he went through all of that, he came out the other end saying, God, I'd heard about you, but now I've seen you. Now I know you. How much do we want to know God? I'd like to begin this four-week message by doing kind of a, an overview of, of the scriptures uh, in relation to uh, uh, the kingdom of God, and then we will focus this morning on, on the king. As I read these passages from the Old Testament, uh, it is my goal, as I said, to, uh, to see that, that this is the theme that runs from one end of the scriptures to the other. 
the theme that runs is the, is the kingdom and has a lot to do with the message I want to share with you over these weeks. If you recall, or actually the message I spoke the last time I was here. Do you remember the message that I spoke the, the last time? It was on the lordship of Christ. There's very little difference between Christ being king and being lord. It's basically the same thing, just from a slightly different perspective. Jesus is the lord of the universe because he is the king of kings and the lord of lords. In light of the kingship theme, or the kingship of Jesus, the theme that runs from one end of the scriptures to the other is therefore uh, the kingdom of God. That is the gracious rule of God in the hearts and lives of his people as they submit themselves to his rule. We will never grow in our depth of soul until we submit ourselves to the hand of a good and gracious God and receive from him, come what may, as that which is good and perfect for God to accomplish his purposes in us and through us. Thus, it's important to note that from the very beginning of time, there's always been a people of God, and all of those people of God have basically functioned as, as or under the king, under the king of glory. Though he established kings on earth as his uh, administrators, I guess is a good way to put it. So again, the theme is the gracious rule of a loving God who reigns over people. So let us look at a, at a number of passages this morning. Uh, I put the, them on the screen so you can write them down and take them home and look at them later if you want to, but I'll just quickly try to read through them because I see time is going very rapidly. Uh, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, so that they may have dominion, so that there may be a kingdom, that man may submit to God and have dominion over the earth, over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over the cattle and all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Well, we could, I could get off track in a hurry uh, in relation to this in, in the world in which we live today. This world was created for God's purposes and for man's enjoyment and that man might rule, not that the animals might rule, not that nature might rule, but that man might rule. So from the very beginning, at the end of Genesis, or in the beginning of Genesis, we see uh, this is, is true. In Genesis chapter 12, again, we see the concept of a kingdom, the coming of a nation, and Yahweh said to Abraham, go forth from your land and from your, and from your kind and from your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will make you a great kingdom. And I will, make, and I will bless you and make you, your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. From the very beginning, the Jewish people were established to be God's people, God's instrument to bless the nations, the children of Abraham. And beloved today, spiritually speaking, the father of our faith is Abraham, and we are children of Abraham. And our purpose is to be a great nation, a great kingdom, that through the church, the nations might be blessed. Who was this Yahweh that Abraham that spoke to Abraham. In Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 and 3, we, see, we read, Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak to the heart of Jerusalem and call her out that her warfare has been fit, fulfilled, that her iniquity has been removed. And we could spend a lot of time there in relation to God removing sin. 
that she has received from the hand of Yahweh double for all of her sins. The voice of one calling, prepare thee the way of Yahweh in the wilderness. Make smooth the desert and the desert, the highway of my God. Who was this Yahweh? Who was the Yahweh of the Old Testament? Who was the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Well, we see that in John chapter nine, uh, chapter one, verse nine, beginning in verse nineteen. And this is the witness of John when the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, "Who are you?" He was a strange duck. Lived in the wilderness. Dressed in skins, eating locusts and honey. I don't think the locust, I think the locust was a form of plant. We think of locusts as being little varmints, but I think it was a form of plant, but it doesn't matter. He was a strange duck. And they said, who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, why then? What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, no, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Therefore, they said to him, who are you? So that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord or make straight the way of Yahweh. Why? How do we know that? Because he was quoting directly from what the Old Testament had said that the one, the voice of the wilderness would come, and it was Yahweh. And who was this Yahweh? It was Christ. In Galatians, now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say into seeds as referring to many, but rather to one. That is the Christ, the Christ. The New Testament, two more verses as we look at this overview of the fact that there is a kingdom, and Christ is the king of the kingdom. In Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, now after John had been delivered up into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. It's interesting how that's worded. When John was delivered up, who was this John? He was the last of the Old Testament prophets. In fact, we read in the scriptures that of those born of man, those who had not yet been born again of God, of those who had simply been born of man, those who were of the Old Testament kingdom of God, there was none who was greater than John the Baptist. But he says, anyone who is in the New Testament kingdom of God who has been born again, the least of the ones in the New Testament, is greater than John. Why? Because we have greater privileges. Matthew chapter 24. And the gospel of the kingdom shall be proclaimed in the whole world as a witness to the nations. And then the end will come. The gospel of the kingdom. In Genesis, he spoke of a kingdom. To Abraham, he promised he would make him a great nation, a great kingdom. We come to the New Testament. We see that there's a gospel, the good news, and the good news is of the kingdom. As we consider the kingdom of God, I believe uh, the best way to begin is by looking at the king, the king of the kingdom. Many of my thoughts, I want to let you know ahead of time, were influenced greatly, once again, by John MacArthur and, and Alistair Begg. I do that because it's a sin to plagiarize other people's material and not acknowledge it ahead of time. My thoughts have been greatly influenced by those two men, two of what I believe of, a, of the best preachers in America today who st stood firm for the things of Christ I spent a great deal of time listening to them. As it says on the screen this morning, I want to start with a look at the king of the kingdom. Next week, I want to look more at the Old Testament kingdom of God 
and then the following week, the New Testament kingdom of God, and what we'll do on the fourth week is not quite clear yet in my thinking. Jesus is the king of the kingdom. First, I want us to see how the kingship of Jesus unfolds again throughout the scriptures. It's kind of a, similar to what we just did. I want to do it as, as briefly as I can, and then I want to make an application for each of us here this morning. Why is it important? What does it matter? In Genesis, once again, in Genesis chapter 49, there's a promise of the king. It says, and the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall the obedience of the peoples be. And whenever the scriptures speak about the peoples, it's the nations. It's a wonderful thing. We have a king. He is the king of kings. And he is at work in this world today, subduing the nations. Now, when I look around and you look around, it certainly doesn't look that way, does it? It doesn't look that way. But we have to understand that there's people from probably almost every, if not every nation on earth today, who have become part of the kingdom of God, who's part of the church, which is the kingdom of God. And that is the purpose that was promised from the beginning in Genesis, that there would be one who would come with a scepter, a rule, and he would, and tribute would be given to him, and he would subdue and bring into obedience the nations, the peoples. In 2 Samuel, we're all familiar with this passage that speaks of Christ. In fact, it has a twofold meaning. He says, when your days are fulfilled, he's speaking to, to David, when your days are fulfilled, you will lie down with your fathers, and I will raise up one uh, of your seed after you, who will come forth from your own body and will establish his kingdom. It's interesting, the New Testament begins with the genealogy of Jesus Christ, and in the midst of that genealogy is David. He's there in the genealogy, and here he promises, and he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish his throne, uh, the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will reprove him. And with the rod of men and, and the strikes from them, uh, and, and the strikes from the son of men. Now, this is an interesting passage. We know that it speaks to, about two people. It speaks about the one who's going to be the immediate fulfillment of the message, and it speaks about the one who is the ultimate fulfillment of the message. The first one was Solomon. When we read about the fact that he was going to strike the one who was, excuse me, he says, and I will be a father to him, and, uh, and when he commits iniquity, Jesus never committed iniquity, so we know it's not simply speaking of him, it's speaking of, of, of Solomon. That's the way scripture is. That's the way prof uh, prophecies are. Prophecies are like uh, when I was a teenager and I climbed Mount Katahdin. When you break through the, the, the tree line on climbing Mount Katahdin, you look up and there's the summit. And you think, oh, great, not much further to go. And then you get to the summit and you find out what? It's not the summit. There's another summit beyond that that was hidden. And that's the way it is with prophecy. We see the fulfillment, we see the summit, and when you get to the summit, you look ahead and you see that there's a greater fulfillment, there's a greater summit yet to come. It says here that he would strike uh, the one who did iniquity. Jesus was not struck for his sins, but he was struck. He was struck for your sins and for my sins. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the, I think I was supposed to click this. No, nope. too soon. Now I've messed it all up. Sorry. He will be great, and will be the, called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, it says in Luke. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and there will be no end of his kingdom. 
Then in Isaiah, we read, Behold, a king will reign righteously. The Lord Jesus reigns in righteousness and holiness today, and someday the whole world will bow before him. In Zechariah 9, verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughters of Zion. Make a loud shout, O daughters of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and endowed with salvation, lowly and mounted on a donkey, even the colt, the fold of a pack animal. We know this is fulfilled when we come to the New Testament, don't we? We see it fulfilled as Jesus rode into Jerusalem. As Jesus rode into Jerusalem, we read these words, and he took, it's happened when you push the button at the wrong time, and this took place in order that what was spoken through the prophet would be fulfilled, saying, uh, oh, to the daughters of Zion, behold, your king is coming, lowly and mounted on a donkey the cult of a pack animal. This was the fulfillment. What have I done? Sorry, folks. The New Testament scriptures concerning Jesus as king. In, in Mark chapter 1 and verse 14, now after John had been delivered up into custody, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. He came as the king. You remember that when Jesus was accused of, of uh, before Pilate, uh, he stood before Pilate, and they said, this man claims to be a, 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 uh, the king of the Jews. But if I'm getting ahead of myself. I apologize. You remember that when Jesus was accused of, of casting out demons, they said he cast, it out, cast out demons by what? By the power of the devil. But Luke says, Jesus says, but if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The king is here, and I have come, and I am casting out demons because I am the king that has power. Then the whole assembly rose up to him before Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, we found this man misleading the nation and forbidding people to pay taxes to Caesar in saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, saying, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, you yourself said it. Pilate got the message, didn't he? What did he write and nail to the cross of Jesus? The king of the Jews. The Jews were in an uproar, and they said, don't write the king of the Jews. Right, he said he was the king of the Jews. And Pilate said, what I have written, I have written, for he saw and knew he was the king of the Jews. What a king that we have. A king who was crowned, but not with a royal throne, a crown, but with a, a crown of thorns crushed down on his brow. A king who was robed, not in royal robes, but in scarlet robes, and was spit upon and slapped and mocked. He is our king who allowed this to be done to himself for you and for me. Have you come to grips with that, beloved? That our king sacrificed his life? Second thing I want to focus on, and our time is all gone, and we still have one more point after this, but I'm going to continue on, because you can't fire me. <laughs> Uh, the second uh, thing I want to say this morning is why is it important uh, for those of us who gathered here in this place this morning? So what? What does it matter to us? 
First, it is important because we are all in need of seeing that we are not the kings of our own lives. Remember the saying, I am the captain of my soul. I am the, I can't even remember how it goes, the poem. That's not true. But we need a gracious, loving king to save our souls and to sit us on the right paths. And we have been presented this morning with that king, the king that was foretold, the king who came, the king who sacrificed his life. Jesus is not only the king who allowed himself to be put to death for our sins, but he's also the king who rose from the, from the dead and conquered death and reigns in power at the right hand of the Father, interceding on your behalf and on my behalf. What a wonderful truth. What a wonderful truth. When we stumble, and I think all of us here this morning, this week have probably stumbled and fallen flat on our face and said things we shouldn't have said or done things we shouldn't have done, but it's a wonderful thing that we have a king and we're part of a kingdom and our king is seated at the right of hand of the Father on high, interceding on your behalf and on my behalf. Again, Jesus is not only a king who reigns, but he's also a king who will return and separate those uh, who are under the blood of Christ and those who are still in their sins. And they will face the king that they spurned. Can you imagine what it will be like for those who crush the thorns on Jesus' head and mock him and spit on him when they're resurrected and stand before that king? Can you imagine the horror and the fear? They'll be quick to bow their knee, but he will say, too late, depart from me, for I never knew you. Can you imagine what it would be like for each of us who stand before him and give answer for what we have done with his leadership in our hearts and in our lives? Can you imagine what it would be like for those who have rejected the salvation that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords has brought? Why is it important to us that we gather here this morning? Because he is to be the king of your life and the king of my life. And someday I will stand before him and give an answer for the wasted hours, the frivolous time spent chasing the things of this world and not seeking him. Finally, I was already making an application. I don't know what, how that got there. It was late last night by the time I got to there, so forgive me. <laughs> let, me make, let me ask you directly. What difference does the kingship of Jesus make in your life each and every day? How is your life and my life any different than those who are outside of the kingdom? Do you realize that you have been transported from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light? Though we live in a dark world, we should be careful how we fight the battles against the darkness. What is our goal in life? I hear people say all the time that the only thing that we have to do, or the only thing, I can't remember how they put it, anyway, the only thing that we have to do for evil to uh, succeed is for good people to do nothing. In my opinion, that's a stupid statement. We cannot change the darkness. I believe that the way of evil to win is for God's people to keep silent about the gospel of the kingdom. When we spend our time focused on the things of this world, 
in fighting the battles of this world. We're wasting our time. We cannot change the hearts of men and women and those who walk in darkness, but we can lead them to the light, amen? We can lead them to the King of Kings. Not only do those who walk in darkness need the gospel of the kingdom, but we also need to look at the King to lead and to guide us in paths of righteousness day by day. We poke fun at those, the scripture pokes fun at those who make idols. When we were out in Borneo, when you'd walk up the paths of villages that were still in darkness, they'd have all these little idols seeking to protect them outside. And the scripture makes fun of the one who takes a piece of wood and carves out an image, puts it on the shelf and bows down before it and then takes the residue of what's left after the idol is carved and puts it in the fire and cooks supper. Sheer lunacy. Sheer lunacy. I love the movie The Gladiator. Kind of violent. Wouldn't recommend it for everybody. But I love it in many ways because it is the one who was appointed to be the king who became a slave and then laid down his life for the sake of his people. You can see a picture of the gospel there in that movie. But the sad thing of the movie is when the gladiator would get in difficult times, he would reach in his pocket and pull out a little bag. And in that little bag, he would take out his little idols and he'd bow down before them destroying the very message that the movie could have. The part that troubles me, I read that already. What are the gods in our lives that take the place of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? We often look around us and have faith in our government, in the medical system, and only at our last resort Do we come to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? When all else fails, we fall on our face before God. I'm not saying that we shouldn't uh, look at these things, but I am saying they shouldn't be the first place we look. When life goes south, we not only seek to find, uh, we, we don't often seek to find out what is the Lord trying to say to me through these difficult times. I'd like to end with the words of the song that we played just before this message because it has a tremendous message. Let me point out clearly, this is not the scriptures. What I'm reading is not the scriptures, but it echoes the work of the scriptures. It echoes the work of the King of Kings in our hearts and in our lives. Listen again to the words of the song. Whoever wrote that song had a depth of soul and a depth of understanding of the workings of the King of King and the Lord of Lords, how the gracious King of Glory works in the hearts and lives of his people. I ask the Lord that I might grow in faith and love and every grace, might more of his salvation know and seek more earnestly his face. T'was he who taught me thus to pray, and he, I trust, has answered prayer, but it has, not, but it has been in such a way as to almost drive me to despair. We hope that it's going to be, he's going to bless us and make us a blessing, and everything is going to be great, and we're going to go in grace. But the way we grow in grace is when he brings us to despair and we have no place to turn but to Christ. That dark night in the jungles of Borneo, when I came to despair, there was no place to turn. Sat in a grass shack with a bed and a table and two chairs. Nobody there.
But it was at night in the darkness that God spoke. I hope that in some favored hour, in some favored hour, at once he'd answer my request and by his love's constraining power, subdue my sin and give me rest. I hope that through the good things, through the blessings of God, that I would grow in grace in him. Instead of this, he made me feel the hidden evils of my heart. Beloved, do you see the evil of your own heart? Yes, we're saved. Yes, we're Christians. Yes, we're not the people we used to be. But there's still evil deep within our hearts, deep within our flesh. And let the angry powers of hell assault my soul in every part. Yea, more with his own hand, he seemed, intent to aggravate my woe. Instead of, instead of answering my prayer, he seemed to make things worse. Crossed all my fair designs and schemes, humbled my heart, and laid me low. Lord, why is this? I trembling cried. For thou pursued thy worm to death. Tis this, tis in this way, the Lord replied, I answer prayer for grace and faith. These inward trials I employ from self and pride to set thee free and break the schemes of earthly joy break the schemes of earthly joy that thou mayst find thy all in me. There's a kingdom. There's a king. A gracious king. A glorious king. And he's at work in our hearts. And beloved, it's not in the good times. Because we can make it through the good times. It's when we find ourselves in the valley, in the darkness. These inward trials I employ from self and pride to set you free and break the schemes of earthly joy that you may find Thy all in me. Jesus, the gracious, loving King, the King of glory from the kingdom of God who desires to set us free. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your goodness, your grace, your mercy. We thank you that you are a God who is at work in our hearts and in our lives. Help us, Father, to see as we come to this table this morning reminding us that our King of glory allowed a thorn of crowns to be pressed on his head and mock him and they spit on him and they put him to death thinking that they had destroyed him But this table this morning reminds us that though your body was broken, though your blood was poured out, three days later, the grave was open and you came forth with great glory to do a work in this world as the king of the kingdom. Help us to be reminded this morning that your body was broken for us Your blood was poured out for us that we might be your subjects in your kingdom, accomplishing your purposes for your honor and for your glory. We pray it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.